Alan, I, Alan Hill, I'm representing the School of Art um, and particular the photography discipline here at RMIT University. Um, and I would like to first acknowledge the people of the Woi Wurrung and Boon Wurrung um, language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations, um, on uh, whose unceded lands we meet on today and uh, where I live and work. I would like to pay my respects to the ancestors and elders past and present from all the other sovereign nations uh, across these lands and waters uh, in the colony of what we now know as Australia and pay particular respects to any First Nations people here with us today. Uh, and paying respects is of course the very most basic and most important thing we need to do but I think uh, for people like me as settlers on stolen land we need to make sure it goes well beyond simply paying respect and actually work doing the work to resolve our positions as the beneficiaries of dispossession, genocide um, and the ongoing colonisation. And I guess I would just quickly echo, uh, I was fortunate to be at Gary Foley's keynote last night and the point he ended on after giving us a wonderful history lesson of uh, the black power movement in Australia was to um, say that we need to give our unconditional support to the uh, the next generation of Aboriginal activism in Australia, and he particularly made mention of the warriors of the Aboriginal resistance and seed mob. Uh, and I would also like to just particularly thank the warriors of the Aboriginal resistance, in particular the Brisbane uh, members of that group who uh, I've been fortunate enough to um, work with and, and um, they were really key in kind of educating me um, about sovereignty and... Um, you know, all the related issues stemming from that. The other person who I would like to thank um, in terms of uh, my ongoing education, or, or I, I was just thinking about how to phrase this, but to borrow a, a title of a recent book by Ariel Azale, to think about how to unlearn imperialism. Um, I've had the pleasure of doing that with the Warriors of the Aboriginal Resistance with Uncle Paul Spearham, who was part of that group, who uh, did a session on Monday. I'm not sure if Paul's here. Um, but the other person I think who's, who's been a major part of my unlearning imperialism is the person standing next to me and that's Shahid Lalam. So I'll introduce him, uh, well I won't spend too much time giving you his bio, but um, um, I do want to just pick up on a couple of earlier points um, and to sort of, and I think they're very relevant to what Tony was talking about as well. Um, and that was the other point that Gary made about the distance or there being very little distance between activism and the academy. And I think, I guess, it's so great to be here at a conference about activism at RMIT. So I'd like to thank Olivia for putting that conference together and uh, all the other people involved who I haven't necessarily met, but um, I know what it takes. So thank you, Olivia. I think it's a testament to you and the team behind it. And it's so great to be at an activism conference at RMIT. And I know you're planning for future um, and, you know, particularly I think the Cultural Leaders Program is just um, phenomenal. Um, but I think we all have to work at maintaining or shrinking as much as possible that gap between the academy and activism. Um, and so to take Gary's point about that. And I think the other thing that um, from the other keynote, Patricia Hill Collins was talking about, um, she really set a beautiful framework in, he, in her keynote, talking about different kinds of activisms in in, in much the same way as Tony just did, and I think it's very relevant to what, um, to what I admire so much about Shahidul's work, and is it's to thinking about all these different types of activism. So Patricia pointed out sort of four modes, if you like. So it's protest politics, cultural politics, survival politics, and someone's going to have to help me with the fourth one. Who's got the last? Protest, survival cultural, anyway, there's a fourth one. But this way of thinking about, you know, the way we can be activists in all spheres of our life um, and that it, there's not one way. And um, I think this is what um, Shahidul um, epitomises for me because he's got a list of achievements as a photographer as long as your arm. And like I said, I won't bother you, I won't bore you reading those out. They're in his bio and they're all over the invitations and so on to this talk. Um, but what I find most remarkable about his work is that the way he has taken that activism into so many different forums. And I think he's going to, I'm sure, I hope he will be including, touching on a, a, at least several of these. Um, in, in particular for him, I think it's about working through 
uh, media, it's working through education, and this is a space we've worked in together a lot, um, and, and culture and that um, you know, his work is not about necessarily his solo photographic practice, but about how he's making change um, in all those different fora. Uh, so without any further ado, I'll hand over to Shahidul. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being an adjunct to RMIT and for uh, our friendship and work together all these years. And it's so good to have you here. And um, I hope you will all join me in welcoming him for his keynote. Thank you. Thanks, Alan, for the intro, and thank you all for being here. Um, I, some of you might have noticed that the title here isn't the title that was advertised, um, and that's deliberate. I was looking at um, you know, how the sessions were going and whatever, and listening to Patricia and Gary and Kadamur and others, um, I sort of began to question the theme itself. Uh, you know, are we really at the margins? Uh, we're talking about people with agency, people who represent 80% of the world's population who live at less than $10 a day. And I'm not prepared to let the one percenters dominate that space. Our activism is mainstream. Uh, we are center stage as far as I'm concerned. Um, sure, as an artist, uh, I recognize that the periphery is very interesting and that's where the great flux takes place. But um, and where innovation takes place, where frontiers meet. But that's, that's at the boundaries, and that's okay. But that's a different argument. And I, I, I'd like to uh, bring us back to where we are. Uh, again, this, some of this actually uh, took place uh, last night over dinner. I was very fortunate to be sitting across Gary and Patricia. Uh, and as we talked, uh, I began thinking of some of the things that being brought up. A lot is, many of the speakers have talked about the rule of law and what it means, about conforming, about civility and what that means. But we forget um, uh, how laws are made, who they're meant to serve. Um, uh, and, uh, well, frankly, before I came to this conference, there was a little bit of a delay. And part of it was because the administrators were worried about my presence. Uh, whether it was safe for me to be here, whether I would be uh, too radical, whether, um, you know, I would be a security th threat myself. Um, sure, we want activists, but we want safe activists. You know, we don't really want people who rock the boat. Uh, and by my definitions, there is no such thing as a safe activist. And, you know, if you're not rocking the boat, then the definition doesn't apply. So. I'll, I'm a picture person, so I'll, I'll go into that. Um, this is in Shabag Square in, in Bangladesh, in Dhaka, where I live, the city. I'm in today's day and age, I'm one of the few people who live and work less than three miles from where they were born. Uh, Shabag is near there. Uh, these are people who've gathered because uh, a blogger called Rajib had been murdered, uh, and this is a protest. Uh, these are not people who are at the margins. They're very much central to what's happening. They, they decide. And resistant movements are never at the margins, I don't believe. Um, these are people, of course, this is happening during the day, at night. And maybe I, I will interchange between we and them, largely because I'm also a documentarian. So while I consider myself to be part of the group, I'm also sometimes taking back, taking pictures, recording, um, so that that shift will be something um, that I will be doing. But, you know, they sang, they marched, they protested, they were at their epicenter. It is the rulers, I believe, who were at the marches. They don't represent the masses. They cling on to power using brute force. Uh, they don't have a right to be there. Uh, and I think we need to challenge uh, that position. So if we define ourselves at the margins, we place them at the center. And I think that lexicon itself is problematic. It happens elsewhere too. I mean, I think you'll recognize the blue shirts for who they are. That applies in many places. In my country, it's sometimes green. Uh, but this is in Sri Lanka. Um, 
again, protesters. This is, I was going to interview Najib, and the day I was there, he was actually being taken to the police station. These are protests that happened then. Uh, coming back to Bangladesh, um, Striti Azad, um, she, and these, that's also for me very interesting. I mean, I, I was looking at Gary's pictures and Tony's pictures today and others, and I can see that these are people who are so rooted to their work. Those images have a direct connection. They recognize people there. Some of them are still around. Striti is someone I'm, I still know and relate to. And there are many people in my old photographs who continue to become part of my life and part of that uh, resistance. But we mentioned brute force, and certainly that is happening. Um, this, the next picture is Professor Muzaffar Ahmed, uh, a leading academic an intellectual who was going to open our show on Tibetans in exile. And uh, as you can see, you know, there's this frail, not frail really, but I suppose physically a uh, not very strong old man, but surrounded by uh, all these policemen. But he's still at the center. Uh, and I think uh, it is the brute force that is peripheral because they don't have the means to resist us on our turf. Um, we did this show, we had the opening in the streets because we want, our gallery was closed down, the entire office of the RIC was closed down. But I'll come to that later. I've been recording the struggle for democracy in Bangladesh uh, over many years now. Um, and I'd left Bangladesh Immediately after the War of Liberation in 72, I came back um, after studies uh, in Britain in 1984, and I discovered that a military general had taken over. Um, so having been involved in this War of Liberation where so many people died, here I was finding the military was back at the helm. So we were able to bring the military general down. I mean, that was... A result of our activism, but um, you know, one of the things you discover then is that uh, elections do not in themselves define democracy. It requires a lot more. This, the woman here, is became the prime minister later, Khalid Asiya. In this picture, this is the campaign trail, and it's all bright. Uh, the media is around. People are singing, dancing. It's very joyful. But the same person, once she becomes prime minister has a very different face to the public. Uh, you, you can just about see her stuck right in the middle of the back. Uh, and this is what has happened to leaders every time it's happened. You know, while they're in opposition, they have a very, very different face to, and they, they turn around. And regardless of who it is, it's perhaps they get caught up in the same things. So I'm, the next picture goes back to 1987 when the opposition got together to try and bring down this autocratic general. This is a picture taken at a university campus. And the students have been very central to the resistance, or had been. Um, this, the picture there, the mural, is of a young man called Nur Hussain. On the 10th of November 1987, which we called the Dhaka Siege Day, when the opposition had all got, gathered together, he had written on his back, let democracy be freed. On his chest, it was to end of tyranny. He was killed by police bullets that day. And he has since become a symbol of our resistance. And this was at uh, the university campus where my partner uh, was then teaching. Um, but this is 1987. A year later, 1988, uh, we have one of the worst floods in a century. Um, uh, the country was devastated. This is in a place called Gofurgao in Mamansing. These are people who haven't eaten for three days. Um, actually, they, they're wondering if the wheat we are distributing might run out. But for me, uh, this became part of a, a story, a long-term story I've been doing on uh, the struggle for democracy. This happened soon after that, when the flood waters had not dried. It was the daughter, the wedding of the daughter of a powerful minister, who also happened to be a newspaper um, magnate. Pretty much the who's who of Bangladesh was there. Yeah, the media, of course, was there. 
not a word was mentioned anywhere. You know, the, it's as if this had not taken place at a time when the nation was reeling under floods. Um, when I tried to show this work, of course, every gallery turned it down. It was going to be sponsored by the Alias Francais, who said, no way are we getting near this. Uh, galleries wouldn't show the work. Uh, the art college had a different excuse. They said, well, it's photography, it's not art. So we deal with those issues as well. But something very interesting happened. Uh, the show was reviewed by a magazine which was owned by the wife of the minister. And I, I found that very strange. And here is this show which has faced so much trouble because it's critical of this minister's daughter's wedding. And this daughter's mother is reviewing my show. Uh, and that's when I began to see how this works. It was a beautiful review. It talked about the artistry of my work, the quality of my composition, the aesthetics, the tonalities, all that sort of stuff, completely ignoring the politics of the story. And you begin to realize how it works. You know, you can be an artist, we'll give you a prize, we'll give you a grant, uh, we'll say nice things about you, just leave the politics out of it and you're fine. And if we go in with that, and of course those are good baits. You know, we like the awards, we like the money, we like the commissions. As long as we are prepared to accept that, yeah, fine, as long the politics is a hindrance, so leave, let's leave it out of it. So I then decided I was not going to allow the politics of my work to be separable from my art. I would produce art where the politics was so embedded within the art you could not separate it. Photography is very good at certain things. It's very good at showing things like I'm showing you, things that happen in front of you, visual things that unfold. It's not as good. It's not as natural a medium for recording the missing. And a lot of what I've done since, and a lot of the recent work that I've been doing is about absence, uh, which photography doesn't render itself so easily to. And one of the stories I've been looking at, particularly relevant uh, for Australia, is the struggle for, of the indigenous people in my country. We had a war of liberation which was about the right to speak our language, and perhaps the only nation that has been formed on the basis of the right to speak a language. Yet within my own nation, after liberation, we deny other people to speak their, the right to speak theirs. And today, the word indigenous is constitutionally banned in my country. If you use the word indigenous, you, you're liable to, to be accused of sedition. The Constitution does not allow that. There is no such thing as indigenous people in my country. So um, there was a woman called Kalpana Chakma, um, a, a leader of the Hill Women's Federation, and uh, she was abducted by the military on the night of the 12th of June, 1996. She's never been heard of since. And I began a series of exhibits using a range of different techniques, some of which was done actually in Australia. The, the first show involved uh, forensic work, which I did at the Brisbane Institute, uh, the Brain Institute in Brisbane. Well, that's another story. It, and I, I, every year I would produce on the 12th of June a new body of work. And on the 12th of June 2015, uh, I began to do a body of work on the champions of Kolpana, the people who'd continued the fight. But here, I went back to that idea of ensuring the politics would be embedded. When I revisited Kolpana's home, I saw that they had very little furniture. Pretty much all they had were these straw mats on the floor. So I decided to use the straw mats as my canvas, as opposed to conventional photographic material. In the last, uh, when I spoke to her brother, I learned that in the last altercation she had with her abductor, uh, it was about the military burning their villages. So I decided to use fire to produce my imagery. So I've got fire, I've got straw mats, I still don't have a photograph, and I've got to work out a mechanism. But in doing so, I decided to bring in another aspect that we were working on. One of them had to do with uh, the garment industry. That was also something which we were very angry about, the fact that uh, 
garment workers were dying in the way they were in, in our garment factories. So I took the laser device that garment factories use to tear jeans. You know, you have young kids today wear, wear torn jeans. They're designer tears, and they're special devices made for them. So I took the garment industry uh, laser device and developed an algorithm so my 16-bit digital images, along with a particular lighting technique, could be modified to allow this laser device to burn these straw mats. And I'm going to just show you a little clipping of that and a little bit of the show now. Um, so this is actually the straw being literally burnt. So it's a charcoal etching, effectively, which is producing these photographs. So these are quite large eight foot prints based on uh, this technique I developed specifically for this. Um, and when we showed the work in our gallery, initially when you go into the gallery, there are two segments. There's one segment which shows conventional work, the settlers, how they've occupied the space, things like that. But the main part, these straw mats, are in a, in a gallery space which is completely dark when you go in. Um, so the, this is conventional, those are the settlers' places. But now we go into the gallery, uh, and as you go in, it's completely dark. What you smell is the burnt grass. And then one by one, the warriors light the candles. So it's performative. What we also did was we took a very powerful point written by one of the Bahari. Uh, we had it read out in the Bahari language. Then the and then we asked the audience to chant the So again, including the audience within that. And a lot of work I involved in Right there is a Pahari student from my school, who can now get a their language. Then my partner will be out to Abandon, neglect, rage, a throbbing womb, my stage. I curl, I tear asunder, awake. I search, I wander. I am who I am, and I will persist. I shall defy. I will resist, I will resist. I shall defy, I shall defy. I will resist, I will resist. I shall defy, I shall defy. I will resist, I will resist. I shall defy. So while this show is going on, we, we know that uh, the military is surrounding the gallery. Earlier on, the 2019 show, which I showed you at Muzaffar Ahmed, uh, that was closed down. The next year, we did a show on extrajudicial killings plus crossfire, and that was closed down. But on that occasion, we took the government to court because we knew they didn't have a legal basis to cut down our show, but it had never been challenged. So we took the government to court. This is the water uh, in, uh, there's a lake that has been formed by, the, by building a dam and the palace of the Chakma King is underneath that. All these people have been displaced because of this lake that has been formed. So that, that again resonates in many ways. But I'll move on to something far uh, much nearer, and I, I will go forward and back a little bit. Uh, what happened on the 29th of July 2018 was there were two students, Rajib and Mim, who were run down by a bus. They were waiting outside the school, waiting for the bus. The bus mowed them down, kill, killing them instantly and injuring 11 other students. And of course, there was a huge protest. Uh, 
it led to a countrywide campaign, a huge resistance, uh, which would have been surprising because, you know, sure, the death of two students is very sad, but it does happen in, in a country like Bangladesh. I think what had happened was that there was this pent up anger over a long period of time, over a whole range of things, and this was the flashpoint. But one of the reasons it was also happening was because this person, the minister responsible, in responding to the questions and accusations was seen to be laughing. Uh, said, yeah, you know, two kids dying, it happens. There are many other accidents. And it was his laughter that really enraged the people. And what it says there is Kuni. This is a stencil on a wall um, taking place at that time. But this student movement became very big. Um, but what the government did then was they sent uh, an armed cadre of the political, their political wing to attack these students with machetes and helmets. Uh, and the police were standing by watching it happen. They, the police were effectively assisting uh, this taking place. I was recording this. I was transmitting live. Um, on the 4th of August, uh, 2018, I got attacked. My equipment smashed. But I continued to work. On the 5th, I was back in the streets taking pictures. That day, I gave an interview to Al Jazeera. That night, I was alone in my flat uploading pictures. When the doorbell rang, um, and essentially when I opened the door, they, these people burst in, and I realized what was going on. And uh, I knew, you know, I'm, I live in Bangladesh, uh, uh, I knew that those seconds were very important, and I tried to resist as much as I could, making noise, making sure that others knew what was going to happen. But I got taken away, um, and uh, uh, the following day I was taken to court, and you have, you know, this brute force of the, of the state uh, upon a person who's speaking out. But again, as that's happening, we continue to be center stage. Uh, we continue to be dominating that space. And I, I refuse to be uh, pushed to the margins. And this led to a massive campaign, which included, I mean, I don't know if Antonio's here. I mean, there was a mass, big campaign here in Melbourne as well. And people across the globe uh, resisted. So I'm very grateful for you for, to you for that. But what I am surprised about, though, is at least from what I've seen so far, I might have missed something. Uh, what hasn't been talked about in here? I mean, here you've had people protesting about me when I've been jailed in Bangladesh. Yet in a seminar, conference and activism, no one's mentioned as such. Uh, and I found that very strange. This is Drick's building in Bangladesh where this banner hangs, and it's the only place in Bangladesh where this banner, banner, hangs, banner hangs because no one else will be doing it. But, I mean, let's look at what Assad did. Whether we like him or not is irrelevant. But, but let's analyze what this man has done. He's given private information and corporations for free. And information being sold is celebrated in a very different way. And this is a person who has extradition against him. Several governments together are trying to accuse him. Uh, and what's more interesting, the war crimes that WikiLeaks reported, none of the people accused of the war crimes have had charges against them. Piet Assange is now, and there is a UN reporter who, who's actually made a statement saying he's been subjected to psychological torture. So that's happening, and I just found it interesting here. Uh, you know, I, I was certainly expecting a very different conversation to take place. But for me, what's also very interesting is the role of the media. So I, I showed that Assange poster. It dangles on our building. I would have thought it would have been there at the press club. In the press club, it's a different set of images. These are images, banners of our prime minister. So this is a situation where the media itself has abdicated. They have left their role. Instead of being on the side of the people, being on the side of the majority, 
they side with that small 1%, and I find that very problematic. So another uh, series of works that I've been doing is on the garment industry, as I mentioned before. These are scratch marks on the soot as people who were trying to feel, flee a fire in Tazreen fashions. Uh, they couldn't escape, they died. And what we did was we put together, uh, we recognized that the garment industry uses billboards as their space. So we took over the billboards themselves. And this image of the carcass of the factory is on a billboard which is in front of the building which belongs to the Owners Association of Garment Factories in Bangladesh. And on the left it says Arnoi, no more, which is an ongoing campaign we have which, uh, as, as you might imagine, uh, is not prepared to tolerate things. But as I've talked about all these, you might get a sense that our government doesn't really appreciate the arts, is insensitive, doesn't give it importance. I want to dispel that. You know, when we had this show, uh, and it was not a gallery show as such, it was a different show, but when we had this show, the government did respond. You know, they, they you can hardly say you were being ignored. I mean, how many artists uh, can make a statement of that sort? You know, pretty soon the machine guns arrived and all of that arrived. And, but that's, that's the space we operate in. And that, in a sense, I, I think at least when these things happen, perhaps our work has a meaning, our work is making an impact. And this is the work we have to do. Um, you know, we're in the streets when that happens. When the gov, um, the next two pictures are about environmental issues. There is uh, another issue which is very close to Australia in the sense that there are coal-fired energy plants being set up in uh, the mangrove forest near the mangrove forest of Bangladesh, which is a UNESCO heritage site. So you have the tear gassing by the by the police, so here I am documenting that. But when um, some of the activists get picked up and taken to the police station and beaten, I'm in there too. And managing to take pictures and transmit them before I'm found out and the phone gets taken away. So you're working at multiple levels, you have to be. The work we did on the earlier work I was showing you about, about Nur Hussein and, and the democratic movement, was a show that was not going to be shown by any gallery, but we were successful. We were on the 4th of December, 1990, the general announced he would step down. And we decided we would put together a show. Uh, suddenly, the same gallery that had refused our work because photography was not art, now embraced what we did. We didn't have money. Uh, we had very little resources. So you can see the pictures are on cardboard mounts, tackily stuck together and whatever. But that show was phenomenally popular. I mean, we had near riots trying to stop people entering the gallery because we just couldn't cope. The queue outside was over a mile long. In the three and a half days we had the show open because the 16th of December was our victory day. We had to close by then. We had 400,000 people come in those three and a half days. Uh, that is the power of, of activism. That is the power of art, and the combination is, is tremendous. I'll go back to the Crossfire show. The Crossfire is a term that was introduced in our lexicon uh, as a euphemism for extrajudicial killings. And we were doing this show again. Our show got closed down. We had the show in the streets. But by then, we knew what they do. So we'd informed the media well in advance, they came. So we are still being documented. We are in the streets, live, it's being live streamed. And while all this is happening, and later on we take the very symbols that the government used for repression, and by unhandcuffing un me, Masha Debi, who sadly has passed away, a uh, very loved uh, activist and writer, uh, unhandcuffs me in a symbolic uh, move. Uh, but what I've done in between while this is going on is move back into the gallery and I'm giving a gallery talk on Skype being live streamed with Ale Julia in Paris while the police have surrounded our place with and these are armed people who've supposedly closed us down. So, you know, we're tough nuts in that sense. 
But I'm also going to come back to the point of the center. Because one of the things we looked at, I mean, we've looked, uh, I set up an agency, a school, and a festival, looking at the three things Alan talked about, uh, media, education, and culture as the three prongs through which we exert pressure upon the political space. But we had gained so much stature that we felt this is time to allow them in. So we invited the president of Bangladesh to open our festival, and he agreed. Uh, and this is the country's top dissenter having a tete-a-tete -tete with the president on, on stage. Uh, one of the advantages of inviting the president is you get to write the president's speech. Uh, and that's quite useful, particularly if you're good with words, you can get him to say pretty much what you want. So, A, I, I wrote his speech, but I also used that opportunity. I knew the spotlight would be on us, so I put on my uh, Arafat uh, kafir because that was the time when uh, Gaza was again being attacked and we were protesting. So that, too, became one of the ways in which we were getting that message out. But I'll fast forward now to the most recent festival that we did. And this was after I was being picked up. Uh, I was tortured. I was picked up. I spent over 100 days in jail. But we decided we would go ahead with our festival. And that decision was made while I was in jail, not knowing, A, if I was going to come out, and certainly whether I would come out in time. And as part of that, one of the things we wanted to do was to invite uh, Arundhati Roy um, to talk about the situation in India, the situation in Bangladesh, and you know that uh, entire debate. And very interestingly, again, the government tried to close it down. Uh, we had created so much noise that the leading uh, citizens of the country, who until then had stayed quiet, came out with a statement condemning the government for a, for a cowardly act. People had gathered around the space um, so much that the government felt there was no way it could stop us anymore. And I got a message from uh, through a prime minister's emissary saying, you'll have your space, just give us some time. Um, and while all that is happening, I later uh, got another message from the prime minister asking if she could have 15 minutes with Arundhati. Uh, Arundhati is a cool cat. So she says, yeah, yeah, I, I've met prime ministers before, but I'm here as, as Shahidul's guest. So if the two of us come, I'll be happy to come. And then the invitation gets, well, maybe some other time. But I, I, I'm saying all this because you really need to be that nimble and maneuver that space in a way in which they can't do anything. And for me, another little caveat was uh, what the government had done is they, they, we had a gallery, uh, an auditorium, a bit bigger than this, because Arundhati is a big name. We, we sort of hired the biggest space we could, a thousand-seater gallery, and uh, we were going to do it. The day before the event, the government withdrew permission. It's not easy to get a thousand-seater place at short notice, but we, we found a few places. We found one, and uh, you know, at that time, being Shahidul friendly was particularly dangerous. But I use my jail contacts to use to get this space. And that's also something. I mean, not that I'm recommending jail. But, you know, if you happen to find yourself there, you make other contacts. And all of that is part of, part of uh, your activism. So that was something that happened. And the other thing was the resistance was phenomenal. You know, the biggest public campaign of recent times to release a prisoner was taking place all across the globe. The government before then had um, you know, gone after Professor Yunus, our most celebrated citizen, Nobel laureate, friends of the Clintons and all that, and got away with it. The leader of the opposition has been in jail for two years. The uh, chief justice has been sent on exile. A, a pesky dissident? We can deal with this. Suddenly, when they try and pick me up, the whole world goes, goes alive. And that's also part of what we need to recognize, that we have that power, we have that space, and we shouldn't undermine our own position. So we, we were also tactical, 19th of August, World Photography Day. I'm in jail, so we celebrate World Photography Day in a different way, and again, bringing up those issues. So we produce art in many ways, we write poetry, uh, 
we, we make statements, we take photographs, we sing, we dance, we perform. They have money, they have muscle. They do not have our creativity. They do not have our nimbleness. Uh, and they cannot melt away and reappear as we do uh, when we need to. And while I was in jail, what I also did was work with my prisoners inside jail. So this is artwork we produced in jail. My fellow prisoners produced this in jail. We transformed the jail library. I mean, this is a beautiful library. We, we smuggled in uh, musical instruments. They've written 40 songs um, since, I'd be, I mean, I'm out now. And I must uh, ask you not to circulate the last two pictures, please, because uh, they've been smuggled out by prisoners to me. I, I'm showing them to you, but you shouldn't put them on mainstream media. But I'll, I'll end with two pictures. I was in hospital, uh, you know, recovering, and my fellow prisoners came up to me. I mean, they made sure that I was so well treated while I, no one could mess with me. And then they came up and said, we want one of your pictures. And this was a picture that's known. It's been in National Geographic. It's been in major publications worldwide. It's quite a well-known image. So we managed to get this picture in. And when I come out of hospital, uh, I find a 12-foot mural on the wall of the hospital made by the prisoners in my memory. And yeah, so there are many awards I've won and many other things that have happened. But you know, as far as uh, uh, publication goes, this is the height of it for me. And I'd like to leave you with that because it is that collective resistance that I think we want to catalyze. Thank you very much.